reasons for the Civil War and the reenactment. There's um, between the casters and the townspeople in the church, there's extras in, adding up to 300 to 350 people in some scenes. So it's a lot of clothes. Certainly the caster ball at the end of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the film. Um, and uh, all the character points, you know, who is Lena, where does Lena go, what is Lena's arc, who is Ethan, the same for him, Ridley. Those characters are so individual and they're so unique to who they are that their wardrobe had to go to that place that was as unique as they were. So nothing ever comes from the same source yet it all has to look like it melds together to be one story. So I would say that was a challenging part of it. My inspirations vary all over the place, from, from the world of art, impressionism, uh, surrealism, uh, fashion, going back to the turn of the century, all the way through and including Alexander McQueen. There, are, there is beauty everywhere, there is inspiration everywhere. It's what you make of it and what you use it for, and then what you come up with once you've seen it. I was asked to design the screenplay, and if I read the book, then it might influence me to not do what the screenplay wanted me to do. I will say this, though. I did have my assistant read the book. <laughs> I'm not stupid. So I do know about the, you know, the converse, and I know about certain points that had to be adhered to, and I think had to be called, you know, called to the attention of, of, uh, of the screenplay. So the necklace, the necklace that Lena wears, and certain pieces that definitely would be there so I knew about them but as far as designing the entire picture it was more based on what the screenplay offered and what the and what those characters in in the film were giving us because there are certain parts of the screenplay from what I understand not really, which I, I know certain characters were melded together um, to form one character so uh, Viola Davis plays Emma who is, in, this, in the book, there's a librarian and then there's Amma, whereas in the screenplay, she is one. Amma is the librarian. It was finding the correct pieces to kind of follow Lena's emotional life. Where, where did they come from? You know, the orange crush bottle cap, which is an important piece, is definitely included in there. But the other pieces, where do they come from? Since she's moved around so much and she's been pushed from pillar to post and she's never really had a private, all she's had, I should say, is a private life. She's never, you know, so that, what does she find dear to her? And that's what went into making up the charms that are on the necklace. For me, it's not, it, it's, it's, it's icing on the cake. I mean, it isn't, it doesn't come into, to the creating of the, of the clothes of the worlds that we're dealing with. Telling the story is what that's all about. What happens to, to work for the story and work for the actors and their characters goes on screen, and if somehow that sparks something elsewhere, that's fantastic. But it's never the, what you're looking for. It isn't what you start out thinking about at all. When you say, it isn't something that I concern myself with at all. Because if I did, then I could drive myself crazy and everybody yeah, else also. <laughs> so there would be no point to that. My job is to tell you the story visually, and hopefully you get it, and then if you get something out of it privately, I think that's fabulous, that's great. It is very individual. When you see Emily and, and, and Savannah and those girls, that clique, those people of Gatlin, and what those girls are and what those jocks are and who they are, they are very different physically in, 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 in what they wear and what they look like than Lena certainly would be. But even Ethan, you have to find a place for Ethan to be there, because Ethan is no, she, he is not, shall we say, of Lena, but he is also not of them either. His desire to leave, his desire to separate from that is so strong that that has to be shown in his physical being also. So you've got, within this world of Gatlin, you've now got three di distinct worlds, you know, living amongst them. You have the world of Lena and what she is and how she feels and how, you, how that comes out of her and how you see it physicalized on her. And the same goes for Ethan, and the same goes for those other characters, Emily and Savannah, and so on. So, just within the young people in this, there was three different looks. There were three different ways of looking. And then you get into what the casters look like, and Aunt Del, and Grandma, and Macon, who is yet in another place. 
it's a series of worlds colliding on one another to, to make an amalgam that hopefully is our story and gives us one huge world to, to admire and enjoy. So. I drew on the fact that they are, like Lena is a natural, and so I looked at the elements and I used a great deal of nature in my research. And, and, and Macon being a naturally a dark caster, choosing to be a light caster, for what reason? Because he was trying to protect his niece. It's an interesting dichotomy. It's, you know, who is this man and what does he do? How does, how does he physicalize himself? How does that bit of darkness somehow seep through because it's natural to him? I had to show that too within his wardrobe, within what he looks like. So that, that came out of that. In the world of art and surrealism and pointillism, spots of color and dots of things here and there, just to pull out and give depth to what the clothing is. So I think you see a lot of that going on too. I started this a long time ago, almost 40 years ago I started doing this. And I, I designed for the theater and then in the, in the 70s started designing for film and have been doing that ever since. So I was in New York, I stayed, I was, I worked in New York most of my earlier career. I worked for Woody Allen for 19 years. I did 16 films for him okay. and um, moved to Los Angeles in the 90s and continued to work in film there. The director, uh, Richard Gravenace, called me and asked me if I would be interested. He, brought, he thought that this would be a great project for me to do with him. And we had worked before. Uh, we had done a movie called Living Out Loud. And um, I jumped on it. And then I read it. But because as soon as Richard calls and says, I think I want you to do this, I say, yeah, OK, I'll do it. And then I read it. And he was right. Okay. So I, I have no complaints. We are very collaborative. Um, you know, it's one thing about working with a good director, working with Richard, of which they are synonymous. He has an idea. He knows where he wants this to go, and the direction it's got to go, and he knows where he wants it to end up, which is fantastic, because then you come on board to help steer that ship with him. But there's always a vision that you follow to, and you're always headed in the same place. And that's a strong director, and that's what you want. Because once you know where you're going, you can come up with an, any number of solutions to problems and ideas. But as long as you know and you stay on a steady path, which is what he is all about. Because he wrote it, and he's directing it, and his vision is solid. And you know where you're going to end up. So it's just, it's, it's kind of a great ride. With the um, production designer and cinematographer, we have all worked together as a great group and a great kind of family, trying to, trying to get this visually on the screen. And it's been a pleasure as far as that's concerned, because sometimes it, it isn't, but this one most definitely is, because there is an idea behind it, and it's a solid. I think definitely it'll appeal to all of those, all of those groups. I think teens will enjoy it very much, and I think it follows the book to a great deal that people who know the book will definitely enjoy it. I think people who never read the book will enjoy it. I also think adults, not just young adults, but adults will enjoy it because it tells a great story. And it's, 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 it, there are some wonderful performances going on and wonderful characters created. So what more do you want to go to a movie for? It's just like there's no greater pleasure than sitting in the dark and watching a world evolve in front of you that's kind of magical and wonderful and just takes on an air of, of spectacle that it's nice. It's what movies are about. It's what they're supposed that's why I started doing this. That's what they should be. So it's always good to be done because because nothing can go on forever. And in the end, when it's come together so nicely and you're so pleased with the way it is and you, you have no wounds and you're not miserable in any way, what could be better? It's a great thing. But in the end it means you've done your job and thank God. So you, you it, you know, it always comes to an end, yeah. and it's always a little. There's always a little melancholy involved yeah, because you're so emotional. and you're so close to people, and there is an emotional tie to your, your crew and to your you, know, you make friends, and you know, especially when you're out of town, because you become even more bonded. Because your own personal family is back at home, so your family then becomes these people here. So, but yeah, as I said, it's always a little bittersweet, but not. It's good when things are over. <laughs> My experience with all the actors is extremely, you know, forthcoming. I ask them 
you know, how they feel about things, you know. When you do a movie like this, on a certain schedule, so much of it is done before the actors are even hired. And so you design it basically with the director and you put it together that way. And then you share it with the actors when they come on board. But it also means that you have to give them their due and you have to, you know, honor how they feel about it. So then you start, a, you, the process goes over again and you start to re, and in this particular case, I had very little redoing to do because Richard was so definitive as, as to what he wanted and he shared that with every actor, just like he shared it with me and Richard Sherman and, and Philippe. So we all were, we all started on the same page. So it's not like I had to say to them, oh, well, you know, that he said something different to that he didn't. So that's what I mean. It's, it's, it's a kind of a group effort. And everybody just joined the group as opposed to trying to split away. Everybody wanted to be on board. And so it became a great kind of family. It was, it was great that way. My crew. Uh, my assistant, you know, well, depending on the day, you know what I mean? On a normal day, when, when it's the basic cast, my crew, my, you know, my assistant, but let's say there's five to seven people, but for the cast of Ball at the end, which is a lot bigger, or, or, or for the war, even more so, we reenact the Civil War, uh, the crew grew to somewhere 25 to 30 people. So depending on the size of the, the group working that day, the crew then goes up and down as far as the numbers of people you have on set. I've been doing this for 40 some odd years. If there isn't a zipper that doesn't close or a hem that doesn't fall down or a pair of pants that doesn't get ripped, you're not doing your job. That, that's going to always happen. That's just always going to happen. Those are days you get, but they come and go so quickly. Those things, you fix those so fast, you don't even remember that they happened because you don't have time to sit and dwell on that. You've got to move. That camera is rolling. And once they start rolling, you've got to be ready. So yeah, those things happen all the time, but you don't put them in that box of memories that you want to know about. You just, you fix them and you move.